So without further ado, let me introduce uh, the next speaker, Professor Yugo uh, from Maryland. Um, he did his PhD at Columbia with Jim Barr, and um, it's a great pleasure to have you here um, virtually, giving us a talk on a PD hierarchy for directed polyno uh, poly polymer in random environment. Sorry, yeah. Welcome, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, first, I'd like to thank Kong and uh, uh, other organizers for inviting me. And I really wish I could be there. And I feel bad that uh, I couldn't be there. And uh, um, thank you so much for um, for being flexible. So um, so today in my talk, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss a model in statistical physics called uh, uh, the direct polymer in running environment. And I'll explain how it's related to um, to partial differential equations. So uh, this is a joint work based on uh, I think two 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 joint papers. One with um, Chris Henderson, who's at uh, University of University of Arizona, and the other with um, Tomasz Komorowski, who's um, in Polish Academy of Science. So uh, let me first explain what the model is. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's a model of Random motion, random environment. Okay, so I believe um, the first talk is given by Xiao Qing, and uh, he must have explained what uh, <coughs> random walking, random environment is. So for direct polymer, you can also view it as a, a random walking, random environment, and I'll say more about this later. So, um, so for us, the right. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll first describe what our random environment is. Then I'll, I'll say say something about what the the random motion is. Then I'll I'll try to explain how they are related to each other. So for us, we'll just choose a very simple random environment, which um, I use this V to denote. It's a Gaussian field that decorrelates very rapidly. So since it's a Gaussian process, okay, I assume V has mean zero. Otherwise, I'll just uh, uh, remove the mean. So it's a mean zero Gaussian process. And uh, since uh, it has Gaussian distribution, I only need to specify the covariance function. So it's stationary. So that's a covariance function. I'm assuming that it decorrelates very rapidly. So in particular, in the time variable, it's a Dirac function. In the spatial variable, I use this R to denote the spatial coherence function. So R is also a function that um, decays very fast. So this is just for the um, <clears throat> for convenience. So you should think of the running environment as some running field that is stationary that decorrelates very fast. And uh, uh, for, the, for the random pass, I'll just choose uh, a reference pass measure. So typically for direct polymer, it's either, let's say a symmetric simple random walk or a bond motion. So uh, since since I'll stay in the continuous setting, I'll just assume that I'll, I'll have a bond motion. So basically the model is a bond motion in, in some random environments. And uh, how they are related to each other is, um, is through uh, formulating some Gibbs measure. So I here I sample a bond motion from um, from the winner measure, okay. So 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 this W here is just the path of the bond motion. Then uh, I define this H to be my energy, so it's a bond motion um, um, in this random environment. Um, collect this V up to time t, okay. So that's my energy collected by the bond path. So if you give me, okay. So 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 for random walking random environments, it could like this, right? So you 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 give me one random environment. You fix the running environment. Then in this environment, I run a run walk. Here it's similar. Um, you you fix this running environment here. I I I I sample bond motion from the winner measure. Then I I define this um this energy, which is um uh, the running environment collected by the by the bond pass up to time t. Then the point measure is just this. We not measure all this bond motion tilted by this factor here. So this beta is a positive parameter, which I call um, um, the inverse temperature. So it, it plays a role of the inverse temperature. So in statistical physics, so typically you have a Hamiltonian and then uh, uh, you formulate, you construct a Gibbs measure in this way. So uh, the meaning of this is that uh, whatever, whatever statistical quantity of my polymer I want to compute, I, 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 um, okay, so let's do it in this way. So for instance, if I want to compute, uh, I'll use, so this P 
is uh, the window measure corresponding to the bond motion. If I use p hat to denote the polymer measure, then if I want to compute the p hat of my omega t in some set, then what I do is to um, to look at this expectation. So I have this um, omega t in the set A. Then I need to multiply this factor. Then I need to normalize that. Okay, so this is how this polymer measure is defined. So if I, okay, if I just look at uh, uh, the measure corresponding to this, this omega t, this is just the winner measure weighted by this factor, basically. Okay, so, so, so as I mentioned, I, I first freeze the right environment, then I construct this measure, right? So for each v here, for each relation of v, I construct a measure. So this measure is a random measure here. Actually, this polymer measure depends on the re realization of this v. And uh, it's just the original reference path measure tilted by this measure. So you should view this as the rather nuclear derivative. So whatever quantity you want to compute uh, um, related to the direct polymer, you, you, you treat it as uh, the bond motion, but um, we, I mean, tilt in this way, okay? So, uh, so that's a model here. So I hope the model is clear. I give you um, a run environment. I give you a reference path measure. Then I define my, uh, my Hamiltonian in this way. So that's just the, uh, the environment collected by the path. Then um, I just define the Gibbs measure, okay? Then the polymer measure is just the winner measure. Um, Weighted by by this factor. You think you can ask a question? Okay. Okay. What is the question? Oh, okay. You can. Okay. Sorry. Um. So, is it this measure? Is it a measure on the full path from zero to t? Right. 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 Yes. Yeah. So here I was being very sloppy. So. So yes. Yeah, so it's okay. it's a measure. Yeah. So that's. That's your uh, that's your weight. So it's actually a measure. Um, for instance, the continuous function from zero to t. Yeah. If you give me any t, I form it a measure here. So this is basically uh, I'm just looking at the marginal here, right? I'm just looking at uh, oh, okay. um, the pass at time t. So yeah. So actually, when when people talk about polymer measure, it's a measure on pass. It's not just a measure on one fixed point. Okay. Does this answer your question? Yeah. That's. that's Okay, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, but for for this talk, I'll just um I'll I'll, I'll be mostly focusing on, on one point, which is the end point. So you see that the measure will depend on t, right? Because um this is my weight. So t shows up here. The measure will depend on t. So I could look at the middle point, for instance, t over two or t over three or some other t. But uh, for this talk, I'll just look at t. Okay, so it's the end point I'll be focusing on. Ah, okay. So that's what I just said. I'll, I'll be focusing on the so-called endpoint distribution. So that's the distribution. This is a, basically the distribution of T under the polymer measure, which I call P hat. And as I mentioned, this P hat actually depends on T, right? So, so for each T, I have a polymer measure on the path, which is on, this is the measure on C0 to T. Then I look at the endpoints of the path, Okay, I look at this distribution. Okay, so then you see that I can. This is, uh, in a sense, a formal way of writing down the density of this distribution, right? Because um, for any say f, which is continuous boundary function, uh, f x rho t x d x is precisely the expression of f omega t. Then you have this Gibbs measure here. Then you have this normalization factor here. Okay, so I just now write this down. So 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 this is the density of my endpoint, and uh, uh, I, I want to emphasize here that uh, similar to what uh, what uh, Xiaoqing explained. So so um, so there are two sources of randomness. The randomness coming from the random environment, and the randomness coming from uh, the bond motion. So when I take the expression here, this expression is only with respect to the bond motion. Okay. So the symbol here for me is only taking with respect to the bond motion. Hmm? So uh, this is sometimes called quench density. 
So in when you're doing things like um, random working random right environment environments or diffusion random right environments, when you are talking about the um, non-time behavior, this quench inverse principle and new inverse principle, here we're looking at this density is a quench density, meaning that I freeze the right environments, I look at the density. So also so so this density here I only average the randomness with respect to the bond motion out. Okay, so I hope the model is clear. So that's something I'll 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 be focused on in my talk. And uh, one one thing uh, you may want to pay attention is that as I mentioned, this beta plays a role of inverse temperature. So when beta equal to zero, that's like your temperature is infinity then your polymer just degenerate to bond motion. When beta equal to zero, this part is just one. This is just one. So then this expression is taken with respect to the bond motion. So this is just the density of your bond motion at time t. So it's just this. Okay. So your polymer measure this or this endpoint density, which I'm interested in, will depend on this beta parameter. And when beta equal to zero, that's just this Gaussian kernel here. Okay, so the question is that what's the behavior of the polymer pass? So, so how does how does uh, this random environment here affect the behavior of the polymer pass on large scales? Okay, so in statistical physics, people are interested in in, in, in large scale behavior. Here, uh, the parameter that describes the the scale is t, right? So you you should use t as a length of the of the polymer pass. So when t is very large, um, what's the behavior of that? Whether it's diffusive whether it's behaves like bond motion or whether it's super diffusive or sub diffusive. So how does this random environment uh, change the behavior of the pass? And how, how, how does this beta parameter change the behavior of the pass? Do I have some phase transition? Maybe for small beta, you have a behavior. For large beta, it's another behavior. Or this, this type of behavior I'm interested in. And uh, I'll, 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 see, I'll see more later about the relation between this direct polymer and uh, indeed the diffusion running environment or random walking running environment. So it turns out that you can formulate this model as a model of uh, random walk in the special random environment. Okay, so, so, so um, here are the questions we want to ask about the direct polymer. This is a quantity one interesting. That's a density. So in particular, I want to emphasize that this is a random density. So the randomness uh, coming out of, uh, I mean, comes from uh, the random environment. And uh, for model in, uh, in statistical physics, uh, this is called partition function. This term here is called the partition function. You take the log of that, that's called free energy. I think I use the wrong, wrong notation here. So typically you use Z to denote the partition function. And I'll use F to denote the free energy here. So uh, what are the questions we want to ask? Okay, so this is something I just explained. What's the behavior of the pass? So when T is large, whether it's diffusive or subdiffusive. So here I'm just looking at the, the endpoint, right? If you if you if you think about um this omega T as an endpoint, so that's just the second moment of this uh, of this omega T. So when beta as I mentioned, when beta equal to zero, so this is just the standard heat kernel. So you know that when beta equal to zero, this is of order t because um, um, <clears throat> the bond motion is diffusive. So then I use this Kasai parameter to to describe, I mean, to denote the the exponents of my uh, of my polymer endpoint. So if Kasai is uh, smaller than half, that's subdiffusive. If Kasai is greater than half, it's super diffusive. And uh, when Kasai equal to half, of course, it's diffusive. So, so, so people are interested in figuring out what this Kasai is for this model, and how how does this Kasai depend on the right environment, and how does the Kasai depend on um, the parameter beta here? So that's one thing about uh, about the geometric behavior uh, of the polymer pass, how spread out this pass is. Um, another interesting quantity is the fluctuation of the free energy. So as I mentioned, that's why I said that I wrote the wrong, wrong thing. So, so Z here should really be this thing here. So log of Z is the free energy. So, um, so this is, this expression here is only taking with respect to the bond motion. So this, this term here is still random. So it's a random free energy and people are interested in the the, the fluctuation of the free energy in particular, what's what's uh, what's what's the size of the variance of the free energy? Okay. 
So I use another exponent to describe the size, this chi here to describe size. So you see that, um, okay, here I cannot talk about the beta equal to zero case because in that case, this is order one, right? Because this is precisely one when beta equal to zero. Then in that case, this chi is just zero. Okay? But uh, if if you have um, positive beta, if you have indeed this random environment plays a role, then what should be this chi? Okay? So you have two exponents here that are um, very important for, for this model. Oh, okay. So the conjecture is that indeed equal to one when, when uh, the spatial dimension is one, psi equal to two thirds. So that's super diffusive. And chi equal to one third. Okay? So this is so-called the, um, the one, two, three scaling in the, in the so-called KPZ universality class, which basically says that for, <laughs> for a large class of a model in the university class, uh, the displacement of the endpoints is t to the two third, and the fluctuation of the uh, free energy is t to the one third. And uh, it's it's only proved for um, for a few models, so I should add only here actually. So um, and uh, okay, Timo has done many things um, 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 in this regard, and uh, and uh, um, and this is only for d equal to one. So almost nothing is known for d equal to two. two. So for instance, in high dimensions, the exponent is unknown. Okay, so what should be what should be those exponents? And uh, and and of course you can ask more uh, more refined questions. For instance, here once you figure out what the psi is, you can ask yourself. It's like when when it's indeed the bond motion. You know that omega t divided by square root t is in law is like normal standard normal, right? So in this case, for the polymer pass for the polymer endpoints. The right way to scale things is t to the two thirds because you divide by t to the two thirds. This thing is of order one. You can ask yourself, uh, when t is large, what does this com convert to? So what should be this distribution that uh, replaces this Gaussian distribution here? That's a next level question you can ask. And for the free energy, you can you can you can ask similar questions. So this only tell you the the size of fluctuation. But uh, for instance, if you look at uh, log zt, maybe you center that, let's say subtracts me. And uh, since the standard deviation is to a one third, you can ask yourself whether this converts to, to any distribution. Okay? So there are, there are a lot of questions of this type and uh, it's very hard to answer, answer this type of questions. I mean, even d equal to one and in d, d equal to two, two, almost nothing is known, meaning that so we don't know how to rescale and we don't know what uh, the correct answer should be. So that's that's the uh, those are the two important questions um, people like to ask for this model. So one is about behavior of the path, the other is about behavior of the energy. And uh, so our goal here, the question is here, is how to try to approach the problem from more analytic perspective. So uh, as suggested by by the title of my talk, um, um, I'll, I'll try to draw connection to PDE to try to use PDE tool to uh, an analytic tool to um, to have some different understanding of this problem. So that's a goal here. You can ask one more question. Yeah. To clarify, can you explain again why Z is random for the expectation? Right, yeah, so so yeah, okay. So that's because I, I use a bad notation here. So as I mentioned, I have two sources of randomness. One is V, one is this omega. And they are independent, right? V is the random environment, omega is the, um, oh, the, the bond motion. Yeah. This is position here is only on omega. Yes. Okay. So when you do that, you see that the the, the randomness from the environment still still kicks in, and uh, so, so so that's why it's run. Yeah. So 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 it's, this is a rather um, rather typical thing in statistical physics when people are studying a uh, disorder system. So typically you have a disorder running environment, and then you formulate uh, uh, the Gibbs measure, then your free energy is like log of a partition function. But when, when, when you are trying to compute your, your partition function, you only average um, um, what's called the, it's the thermal noise out. So, so, so the disorder still survives here. Okay, so that's why it's random. Okay. Okay, so now I want to say something about the relation uh, between this model and diffusion random, which is related to Xiaoqin's talk. And uh, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this row is an endpoint distribution. 
right? So when I do this, when I test the endpoint distribution with some uh, some test function f here, then I can write in this way. So for any let's say bounded function, this is a well-defined random variable. So let's just f test with a density. So how is this related to diffusion random environment? So the, the, the idea here is that uh, this looks very much like Feynman cast formula. Because, uh, uh, I mean, this is what I just explained. This, this explanation is taken with respect to ground motion. So I, I, think, I think for the moment, you can just pretend that V is deterministic, V is fixed, okay? Then, uh, then uh, this is taken with respect to ground motion. Then this is almost a Feynman cast formula. Then the Feynman cast formula gives a solution to some PDE. So that's a solution to a PDE. And this is a solution to another PDE. So that's a ratio of two solutions. Then maybe this thing will solve a PDE as well. Okay, so that's that's where this relation to the diffusion random environment uh, um, comes from, actually. So, uh, but before doing that, I um, uh, okay, it's uh, it's not exactly the Feynman cast formula because in the Feynman cast formula you need the time reversal, and you need you you need the starting point which is x. So so here I slightly change the notation. So here e sub x is the expression with respect to the bond motion starting from X. So this X is a starting point to my bond motion. Meaning that omega zero is my X. So if you look at this numerator here, I have almost the same thing, except that my V is being time reverse. And here I have VS, but here I have V of T minus S. And the other difference is that rather than starting the, on the path from the origin, I start the path from X. So now I have a dependence on T here, a dependence on X here. So I call this thing UTX, that's my U. And similarly for this thing here, I call this thing WTX. So, so since the since, uh, starting point is also changed here. And I call the ratio phi. Okay? So as I mentioned, uh, in this way, I, I indeed have U solve a PDE and W solve a PDE, then maybe it's phi solve a PDE as well. Let's see. Ah, oh, okay, so this is what I just explained. So you, you solve this heat equation with a random potential here, and W solve the same equation. So U and W solve the same equation. The only difference is this initial data here. So the initial data shows up here. And since this is one, so it doesn't show up here, okay? So that's that's uh, that's a connection to uh, to PDE through the, the feynman katz formula. And since you have two PDE, I look at the ratio, then I ask myself, what does this phi satisfy? So PD for phi turns out take this form. Okay, so it's just a pi chain rule. That's what you get. So it becomes, uh, okay. So for these two equations, they have potential term. Okay, you have zero order term. But when you take the ratio, the zero order term disappear, but you have a drift term. And the co coefficient of the drift is precisely given by this gradient W over W. Okay? But for this thing, you can imagine that this operator, a half Laplacian plus, I have a drift. Here, this is a generator of some diffusion in the environment, which is given by this thing. And this thing is random because W solve this, uh, so, solve this PD with random coefficients. So W is a random process. That's my random process here. So that's the relation between uh, the direct polymer and diffusion random environment. Okay, I just, okay, I just wrote it here. So this, I, 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 I call this drift a, a new name, which is capital U. And this capital U, actually, if you look at W solve this heat equation with random potential, this, okay. So capital U is a gradient of log W. And uh, if, you have a, if you have a heat equation, you know that the log of the solution solve the Hamid-Jacobi equation, then you take the, the gradient that solves some conservation law. And here the conservation law is the Burgers equation. It's a Burgers equation with a random forcing here. Okay. So, so, the way you should think about this is that, okay, you give me a random environment. Uh, I think I use the wrong notation. This is V here. That's my V. You give me a random environment V, then I use this V as a driving force. I solve a Burgers equation, right? So you should think of this Burgers equation describes your velocity field. Okay, so it's a nonlinear equation with a random force. Then in, in, in this Burgers flow, I look at a passive scalar, right? Because typically, uh, um, I mean, people call this kind of thing passive scalar. So you look at dxt equal, let's say dxs, xs equal to u 
t minus s x s ds plus d b s. So b is a body motion and u is my drift here. So u come from the solution to this Burgess equation. Then if I just look at this diffusion run environment here, it turns out that, okay, I hope you can convince yourself, this X here has the same law as a polymer pass. Yeah, because uh, this phi here, this is a backward Kolmogorov equation, right? So this is my U. So then the underlying process is precisely the thing. So that's the relation between um, between this, uh, this direct polymer and the diffusion run environment. And the difference between this diffusion run environment and what Xiao Qing um, talk about is that the run environment here, in a sense, it's more complicated because it's not given to you. So what I gave to you is this V, right? That's my that's my run environment for the polymer. But if I want to formulate it as a passive scalar, then that's U is my run environment. So I need to solve this Burger's equation. I get this U, I get my velocity field. Then I put a passive scalar in the velocity field. I track the evolution of this passive scalar. Then this passive scalar, the law of the passive scalar is the same as the law of my direct point. Mm -hmm. So that's a relation to the, to the diffusion environment, which I find very interesting because, um, because when, typically when people study passive scalar, then your, uh, your drift towards solve some fluid equation, right? Okay, the ideal case is that you consider Navy stocks, but that's very hard. Okay, so here it's burgers, which is much simpler. Okay, so that's what I want to say about uh, the relation to RWRE. Uh, okay, so so now um, come back to what we want to do, right? So this rho is a quantity we're interested in, and the conjecture is that x squared rho t x dx in d equal to one is like t to the uh, four thirds, and in d equal to two, um, nobody knows what should be uh, the result. So. Uh, Okay, so the question is that whether there's a PDE set by like this. Because I, I know that when beta equal to zero, this is the heat kernel. And it solves the heat equation apparently. That's what happens when beta equal to zero. Now I slightly change beta. If you if you look at the thing perturbatively, I slightly change beta, then okay, maybe there are some complicated terms, but okay, you you should have this term here, right? So that uh, that gives you some uh, some confidence that okay, maybe there's some equation, there's some underlying equation. Okay, this is what I just explained. So when beta equal to zero, that's just Gaussian kernel that solves the heat equation. So uh, row row here is random, and it turns out that you can you can you can write down the the SPD satisfied by rho, which is a very complicated non-linear, non-local SPD, which I don't want to write it down. So, uh, so okay, so our goal is more, uh, is more modest, okay? So I have randomness here, right? So, okay, if you want to study uh, this random process, maybe you need to study SPD. But if I, if, I, if I just want to prove super diffusivity, or if I just want to um, identify the exponent, I don't need to, study rho, that's an overkill. I can just study the average rho. So if I can, I take the expression with back to the random environment. So here, this exper this expression is different from this expression here, right? Because as I mentioned, this one is taking with back to the bond motion. Now this one here is taking with back to the random environment. I average the random environment out. Now th this Q here becomes completely deterministic. I ask myself whether I can prove something of this sort. Is T2 in D equal to one. That's the goal here. So I want to simplify the problem so that uh, at a certain point, something can be said. Okay, so now the question is that, is our PDE set by Q? And can we use a PDE to show this? Can we use a PDE to find the, the exponent in high dimensions? Hmm? So that's the goal here. So uh, okay, before before doing that, I want to say something about the, the connection to uh, the stochastic heat equation and so-called the, the delta Bose gas. Um, so it turns out that this endpoint distribution here, this rho t x, um, t minus x e to beta h divided by this. So as you can imagine, through through some finite cast 
representation in this row itself is related to the solution of stochastic equation. So I call this thing here the stochastic equation. And uh, uh, if I if I start if I start this equation from the Dirac initial data, okay, I get a, a positive um, random field. If I normalize that, meaning that I divide it by uh, it's our norm, then it becomes a density. Okay, it turns out that this is the density. So um, the reason why I want to mention this is that um, people have spent a lot of time uh, study this Z. And the way they study the Z is by taking the moments because the thing here is random, right? So uh, if I if I define the endpoint covariance function of this Z by this, okay. So Z, Z itself is a random field. I look at Z at TX1, Z at TX2, Z at TX, and I multiply them together. I take the expression. I get a function which depends on t x1 up to xn. Then this un here it turns out solve this heat equation with a potential in this way. Okay, so this r here I forgot. Okay, let me remind you this v v is a Gaussian field that is white in time and smooth in space. So uh, if I compute the covariance function, I have a Dirac function in the time variable. I have r in the spatial variable. So r here is the spatial covariance function of this v. So when I when I when I look at the the equation set by this U N, this R shows up for obvious reasons. And uh, it turns out that U N solve this nice equation. So it's a heat equation with a potential given by this thing here. Hmm? So that's a, so okay. So when R equal to Dirac function, meaning that when you are dealing with a space-time white noise, this operator here is so-called delta both, I guess, right? So you have this um, this kinetic part, you have this potential energy, and this potential energy is the so-called co contact interaction, meaning that when two when two particles are, are separated from each other, there's no interaction. Only when they touch each other, there's this drug in interaction. So this delta both, I guess, has been studied extensively. Hmm? So the difficulty here is that um, the moments of the day doesn't easily uh, translate into the moments of rho because rho here, the interest quantity is a ratio, is a z divided by its integral. So I don't have this for obvious reasons, right? If you, if I if I can study this, then good. But uh, so that's the ma main difficulty here. If you if you if you if you look at the problem from the point of view of the cascade equation, when I compute this, I need to compute the ratio of two random quantity. Okay, so now let me let me try to state the our main result. So that's a lot of uh, preparation. So that's the endpoint distribution. And uh, okay, so inspired by this, right? So 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 I'm looking at this um, endpoint correlation function of this z. This u n solve the PDE here. So I do the same here. I look at my row. I look at I value my row at t x one, t x two, up to t x n. I multiply them together. I compute. The expression. So I average the randomness out. So I get my QN. Remember that I'm only interested in Q1. Q1 TX is just the expression of rho TX. Right? Okay. But I define QN. And that's my that's my random environment. As I mentioned. So the main result is that QN as a sequence of functions solve a PD hierarchy. So uh, so the equation for Qn is related to Qn plus one, Qn plus two. Okay, so Q1 is related to Q2, Q3. Q2 is related to Q3, Q4, and so on. So the hierarchy is not close because okay, each n, I just go two steps further to n plus one, n plus two, okay? So that's the equation I derived. So, so, so the goal, remember that the goal to study Q1, right? Okay. So it turns out that the Q1 itself does not necessarily solve a nice PDE. Okay. So Q1 solves this equation with two extra terms. So that's um, the first result. And if you compare, if you compare what uh, I showed here, for this UN here, if I don't look at this denominator here, if I just look at Z, so you see that rho is proportional to Z, right? Then if I just look at Z here, U will solve this equation, U N will solve this equation. So U N is not related. Okay, so it's just one single equation. It's not related to U N plus one, U N plus two, right? But for this Q N here, this part is the same. Okay, that's the delta both I guess part, essentially. 
but you have the connection to, to I mean, the coupling to Q1 plus one, Q1 plus two. Okay. So that's one result. And of course, the, the question is that, okay, what can you do with this hierarchy? Whether, whether you can make use of this deterministic hierarchy to try to, um, to try to do something like this, right? I want to look at x squared, dx, dx. What's, okay, what's the size of this integral when t is large? Whether I can use this deterministic object to, to study such problems. So, okay, Q1 is what we're interested in. So that's the equation for Q1, okay? It's related to Q2 and Q3. And uh, R, R here is the spatial coherence function. Basically, R tells you that how, how correlated in the spatial variable uh, this random environment is. So uh, you should, okay, R, the assumption here is that R is very local, right? It's like compact supported. So, okay, I don't, okay, I don't know how to explain this. I don't have a, intuitive explanation of those two terms. So, so, so this part is kind of clear because my underlying, for, for this direct polymer, my underlying base measure, my underlying reference measure is about motion, okay? So it's easy to imagine that you have this part. But why do you have those two terms? I don't know. Uh, one way to try to interpret, interpret this is that um, if, I, if I integrate this in the X variable, you see that I can, I, okay. Okay, this is a bit complicated, but I can interpret it as uh, the intersection of two paths because Q2 here is, okay, what's Q2, right? Q2 TXY is the expression of Q1 TX multiplied Q1 TY. So I have a density here, I have a density here. So in the quench sense, since, uh, since I have a product, Right, then it's like I free the random environment, I sample independently from the quench measure. Right, so that's omega one, omega two are independent, but but they're weighted by the same random environment. Right, so this H here contains the same random environment. So when I compute Q2, I average this random environment out. So, so, so that's where the correlation comes from. Okay, so if you, if you, uh, I think a good comparison, uh, uh, a good analog is uh, you think about. Um, independent walkers in the same running environment, right? So you freeze your running environment, then you start independent running walks, okay? So the, once the environment is freeze, those walkers are, are independent, but they're correlated. In this, if you look at a new law, they're correlated through the running environment because, okay, maybe, uh, maybe the drift is larger here, so, so, so many walkers will go to the same place. Here it's the same. Okay, so here I, I, I sample, freeze the random environment, I sample omega one, omega two independently from the quench polymer measure, right? But they have the same random environment. So maybe they will go to the same location where the random environment will lodge so that this, uh, this Gibbs factor will be, will be large, right? So, so uh, this is how I look at this problem. So um, you, you should view, okay, all right. Uh, you should view this thing as the joint density, you should view QN as a joint density of N independent walker in the same environment, right? So, I mean, being independent just means that, okay, I have um, product density here, rho multiplied rho, okay? So since the density is product, so that independent sample from the, the quench distribution, okay? But the environment is the same, okay? So when I take the, the expectation, then I average the environment out, so those walkers, they don't interact with each other directly, but they, they, they interact with each other through their common environment. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's like interacting part system, but they, 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 don't, they don't interact, they don't have direct interaction. And it's just, they, they have a common running environment. Okay. okay, so the question is still this, right? So why do we have super diffusivity in D equal to one? So, okay, so that's the, the equation. What can we do with this equation? So, okay, we don't know what to do. So we just, uh, we just do a very uh, naive thing. We, we assume there's something called propagation of chaos, meaning that the, 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 uh, the joint density can be factorized. So Q2 here, so Q is defined in this way. So Q2 here is factorized into Q1 multiplied by Q1, Q3 is factored into three, three factors, okay? So, 
So I don't know whether it's hot, right? So maybe this is completely wrong, but uh, okay, what if it's right, right? So so in this way, if you just replace Q2 by two factors Q1, Q3 by two factors, by, by, by three factors Q1, then you close the equation because then this equation only involves Q1. Okay, so it's this equation now, right? So that's that's a reaction diffusion equation, but it's long local because you see that I have an integral here. Right, I have the, okay. So uh, this looks complicated, but if you if you think about the the simple case, okay. So let's look at the case when R is Dirac, meaning that it's space time Y noise environment. Then, yes. No, but I think it's just white noise. Okay. So 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 uh so then this term becomes minus beta square Q one T X square. Then the last term becomes plus beta square. Q1 Tx, then you have to multiply the L2 norm, right? Q1 L2 norm square. Because R is Dirac, so this is L2 norm. So then if you look at this equation, so it's a nonlinear, long local equation. So, so it turns out that it preserves the, the density, meaning that if you look at this equation here, if you start from a polarity density, meaning that if Q1, 0x is now negative, if the integral is one, it's a density, then you integration by parts, you see that Q1, Tx is also a density. Is also a density. So this approximation here, in a sense, in a sense, it's a reasonable approximation because um, you still get the evolution of the density. Okay, so you just intuition by powers. You see that this term essentially cancel this term. Uh, okay, so that's what I said. The above PDE describes the evolution of a probability density. So, okay, so we start from this uh, thing, which is a true thing. We arrive at this thing, which is uh, maybe a fake thing. Right? So, so, so this Q here, I just use this Q because I don't want to use Q1 because uh, Q1 solves this equation. So, so we prove the following results. So, so, so now, now, now it's a purely PDE problem, right? You have this nonlinear, long local um, reaction diffusion equation. Then you ask yourself, uh, how fast does this spread out the density, right? So I start from I start from a density, probably density. Then I ask, I mean, for instance, uh, something local, right? Something local. Like this. Then I ask myself, this QTX is also a density, then how spread out this QTX is. Okay? So that's the result. So we look at this Q. Okay, we look at the second moment. Indeed, in D equal to one, we get the right exponents. It's indeed what uh, what we expected, T to the four thirds. And in high in higher dimensions, we get diffusive behavior. So okay, so okay, when we get this exponent, we're very happy because we saw that okay, this is something new. But what, whether whether it's a reasonable approximation, whether it's Q indeed approximates Q1, okay? It's unclear to us whether um, it's a coincidence or not. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, uh, a lucky or uh, unlucky coincidence probably. So, uh, okay, let me see what... Ah, okay. So indeed, um, the way uh, we interpret this approximation is wrong. So we don't have we don't have um, propagation of chaos. So this cannot be factorized. So it turns out that in a sense one can show this cannot be factorized. Q one T X. This is not true. And the reason why it's not true is because uh, the correlation is so strong. Okay, maybe I'll explain this later. So I think I'm running out of time. So let me skip this part. So, uh, okay, so I'll explain this later. Uh, okay, so let me, okay, before before explaining why it, 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 it might be a wrong, wrong approximation, uh, let me let me try to, uh, uh, again, draw connection to the diffusion run environment and see, see what is going on there. Okay. Um, but before I, I do that, any questions? Uh, I think you can go ahead and reserve the question for, you know, the last 10 minutes. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. So let's look at the right and walking right environment. So now, now, now I just write this thing in this form. So this B is a one motion, U is just a random field. UTX is a random process. Okay, of course, if you want to 
prove things like inverse principle, you need to make some assumptions on this U. And uh, 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 okay, for the moment, we don't make assumptions. Okay, that's what I said. Uh, I can I can do the same thing, right? So 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 for this thing here, I can I can um, define the quench density. See, so this rho T X, I'll just write here as this expression. You rock x t minus x, right? That's my density. So this equation is taken with respect to b, the same, right? I I, I look at this thing here. I average is boundary motion out. So the randomness one is used still survived. So this row is a a random density. Then I can I can I can define the same thing. I I, I define the endpoint correlation function, and uh, define in the in the same way. So then you see that this is the density. This is still density. Q n is the density on R n. As I mentioned, you should view this Q as a density of an independent worker in the same environment, right? Okay. So, uh, so in homogenization or, 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 or from a more progressive pro perspective, if you want to prove inverse principle, okay, for this kind of time dependent right environment, then um, you can, uh, I mean, there are many results. For instance, if you use divergence free and you have some interoperability condition to satisfy, or, or if you decode sufficiently fast, then indeed you have a quench inverse principle. You can show, okay, under certain assumptions, I'm being very sloppy here, okay? So under certain assumptions, you have quench inverse principle. Q inverse principle, okay? Meaning that free the right environments, you have this, and W here is a bond motion. So let's see, in this case, okay, that's what I just said. You have quench inverse principle, meaning that for each realization, I take the, um, ah, okay, uh, I wrote something wrong here. I take the bounding continuous function, then I need to rescue that, right? Because uh, it's diffusive, so I should multiply this thing by square root t here. Then maybe I have square root, uh, we have t to the d over two here. Then it convert to f integrated uh, against the Gaussian kernel, right? So that's what quench inverse principle means. So this would imply that since it's almost sure convergence, this actually would imply that this holds because if I if I multiply this Qn here by test function, let's see, by some capital F, X1, Xn, right? I integrate in X1, Xn, then capital F multiply rho here, the product rho here. But since I have quench inverse principle, this thing should converge to to um, capital F multiply rho bar here, basically. So that essentially shows that in, in a certain weak sense, weak, weak meaning that I multiply test function, in a certain weak sense, this, this multi, multi point density factorize. So in, in the setting or in the regime where you have homogenization, this is indeed the case because you have quench inverse principle. Quench means what? Meaning that this, this, this border motion here, the randomness here only come from the randomness here. So this random environment in some things plays a no plays no role. Of course, what I said is wrong because the, the sigma here will depend on the random environment. But uh, but uh, um, but what I was trying to say is that the um, most of the contribution come from this B here. That's what I was trying to say. Maybe that's not a very good statement though. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, so when you have quench inverse principle, indeed you have this factorization of the multi-point density into one-point density. For direct point, okay, that's what I said. Propagation of chaos uh, uh, prevails in the homogenization regime. Uh, okay, so you can ask yourself, what if this U is um, the solution to a burgers, right? Because that corresponds to the direct polymer. So in that case, okay, maybe some strong correlation in this U will destroy the thing here. Maybe you don't have inverse principle. I mean, you don't have quench inverse principle. So, okay, so that's um, something I want to uh, comment on. So, okay, so I don't think I have time to um, finish. Uh, so uh, there's something we can, okay. So what I just presented is that I showed you a PD hierarchy, right? And you, from that PD hierarchy, we'll come up with some approximation, which we thought is a right approximation, but it turns out maybe not the right approximation, okay? So now the question is that what we can do with a hierarchy, okay? So there are several things we can do. 
So uh, those classical results, uh, which is in high enough dimension and for high enough temperature, the polymer is actually diffusive. Okay, so we can recover this result using the hierarchy. So starting from this equation, we can prove the diffusivity and we can prove the, the diffusive behavior in this region using the hierarchy. Uh, another thing, okay, so that's a proof. Another thing we can do is that, um, Ah, okay. So this is what I just said is on the whole space. So the endpoint distribution of the direct polymer was spread out. So this row will not convert to some stationary distribution. For instance, there's no stationarity because it's like you have a bond motion and then the bond motion is everywhere, right? So the, the Gaussian density will go to zero. It turns out that when you are in the torus, okay, when you have compact domain, then there's no place for your density to escape, then rho has a density. I mean, rho has a stationary distribution. So wh what we can use this hierarchy to do is to um, to see something about the limits of the stationary distribution, because uh, that's a hierarchy. If it converts to stationary distribution, then this part just disappear because it doesn't change in the limit. That's zero. So basically, you obtain a hierarchy for the um, multi-point distribution function of the stationary distribution. That's my Q1 here. Q1 of the stationary PD hierarchy. And using that, we can do some small beta expansion. So it's purely PD, right? If it's zero here, then if you just look at the thing here, you have beta here. If you, you can try to do some uh, small beta expansion to 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 see something about the, the Q1 here. Okay, that's what I did with Tomas. So, so the summary here is quick. Uh, let's see. So it's it's a very classical model in, in statistical physics, and uh, we we we're trying to approach this very difficult. I think it's a very difficult problem from from a different perspective, which is this more analytic PDE perspective, and we derive the PDE hierarchy out of that. Using this hierarchy, um, um, okay, we did something, okay, and uh, there are, um, there are much more to do, okay. So um, there's this connection between uh, this direct polymer and diffusion run environment and this comparison between homogenization and localization. And with that, um, I'll just ask these two questions to the analysts in the audience. And uh, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you. Great, yeah, I if you can say it loud, you can say it. And then if you doesn't catch, I can repeat it to him. Um, So are there questions for you? Okay, why we are waiting? I, yeah, now I understand when you say that U is, is very uh, complicated. Uh, uh, but the propagation of chaos and also the, the ideas when you have the um, approximations of the PD, what is interesting to me is sort of like um, you have the uh, second moment independent of the of the kernel R, right? I mean, how can, I mean, can you explain to us? Ah, okay. Uh, right, you mean, okay. Uh, let's see, where is that? I uh, think maybe it's... You have the equation for big Q, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a... It's a no, it's not here, okay, equation. sorry. Uh, I think it's... Um, where the hell? Where is that? Uh, let's see. I think it's here, right? Uh, no, okay, here. Uh, let's see. Wrong well, approximation. It's here, right? Yeah. Okay. So okay, so this R here, it it it, it turns out that for both um, compact supported R and when R is Dirac, uh, um, when D equal to one, we can all get this, and the R, R will show up here, the the prefactor. Hmm. Is this your question? Yeah. And, yeah, because, and, because yeah. here we, we, we're only interested, okay, uh, up up to this stage, we're only interested in the order. So so R, the row of R will just show up as some prefactor here, yeah. I see. And, and what would be a sort of a natural way to prove this result? I mean, like how, how right. can yeah. be naturally so this power? It's, uh, it's complicated proof. So if you look at the, okay, so uh, what R is, well, I mean, as you can imagine, when R is Dirac, it's simpler. So the equation will just be 
uh, a half Laplacian Q. Then let's say beta equal to one, so minus um, Q squared plus Q, you have um, L2, the square of L2 norm. So if you just look at this, you see that it's um, it's a bit like those um, Fisher KPP stuff because you have a Q square here, you have Q here, but this thing will depend on T as well. So uh, something I learned from Nanya, or I mean, I mean, Nanya Rijek over the years is that, okay, I can look at the generalization of this problem. And by generalization, I mean, I, I simply ignore this term. So, mm -hmm. so you can do some back of envelope calculation. For instance, if you assume that QTX so if you assume it take this form like one over t to the alpha, then some function, let's say g of x t to the alpha. Let's say alpha is the exponent you want to figure out. And since q is a density, if you assume that q spreads out the density in the speed of t to the alpha, then okay, let's just assume take this form. So one thing you can do is that uh, you, uh, Okay, so basically you can you can pretend that your solution is exponential of um, QS of this thing DS, then you have a heat kernel here. Because uh, if you if you, if you just pretend that's a Sanini equation, you don't have this term here, then this term only depends on T, right? So that's that's this factor here come from uh, these parts, then you have a heat kernel here. Hmm. So, so if you assume your Q actually take this form, then you can figure out what should be the, what's, what's the order of this term. Then, um, then basically you, but X should be of order T to the alpha. So those two terms should be of the same order. So basically the, the, the two third exponent com, um, comes from balancing the heat kernel, I, I mean, comes from balancing the, the, the effects of the heat kernel and this reaction term. Mm. So, so the heat kernel uh, uh, tends to, this part tends to spread the solution out. This part tends to uh, grow the solution, right? So you have this growth here. And mm. uh, the critical scale precisely come from balancing those two parts. Uh, if, you, if you ignore the, this, this Q square term, which is um, which is um, um, which is actually crucial here, because uh, uh, otherwise this will not be a density. But 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 since you are looking at um, locations that are far away, and uh, um, this Q square, I mean, it's like near near the front. Q square is much smaller than Q, so you can do this kind of approximation. It's a complicated argument, and uh, this this kind of back of envelope calculation um, tells us that uh, uh, one should get the right exponent. But if you really want to go into the proof, you you have a lot of uh, it's it's a lot of work to do. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, so throughout the correlation in time was the. the Correlation function in time with the delta, right? Uh, is there anything? What what changes when that correlation can be the Yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, so qualitatively or quantitatively, nothing should change because, um, uh, it, essentially, as long as your run environment decorrelates sufficiently rapidly, right, you expect the same phenomenon, meaning that the, the exponents and everything else should be the same. And uh, so from this perspective, the reason why we, we assume it's white in time, it's like, it's a technical assumption, but it's an important technical assumption because when it's white in time, then your process becomes Markov in time. Mm -hmm. So your, your row here or your Q here, uh, row, row here, then it's Markov in time. And uh, the, the solution to the, for instance, the stochastic equation will also be Markov in time. So as you can imagine, when you have Markov process, then then uh, then things become much much easier. If you have correlation time, then uh, we will not have PDE actually. We yeah. will not have uh, any PDE. But uh, okay, so that's a good question. So it's a technical assumption, but it's, a, it's an important technical assumption for us. Yeah. yeah. 
So you, what is most uh, curious to me is that your formula based on this a product approximation, it gives you the right answer when B equals one. So yes. So the place where your product approximation seems the most questionable. Uh, I, I didn't hear the last part. Could you repeat the, the last part? The product approximation seems the most questionable to me when D equals one. I, I would believe the product approximation more in higher dimensions. So indeed, uh, okay, let me try to answer this. Uh, sorry, I have many slides here. Uh, indeed, in this regime, yeah, the product approximation is right. Yeah, because you have you have diffusive behavior, right? Okay, so so uh, is this what you're trying to say? Oh, yeah. So why why is it giving you the right answer in the dimension for which your assumption seems most questionable? Oh, uh, okay. So. Um, one answer is okay. This part actually, I'm not sure. So whether it's a coincidence or not, I'm not sure. Okay, so for sure, this product approximation is wrong. But one way, one way to okay. So let me. Uh, so okay, this is clearly wrong in one D. Um, uh, one thing one can do is the following. Uh, so let's see. Uh, sorry. So, uh, okay, so that's this equation. So, okay, so this Q here is the, the expression of rho, right? Okay, so one thing we can do is the following. We can derive the SPD set by rho. DT rho was solved on SPD. So the deterministic part is precisely the same as this part. So let me do the right thing. So it's rho r cos rho plus beta square rho rho are convolved with rho. But you have something like dv. So, okay, so if you if you, if you look at the SPD set by rho, okay, so the deterministic part, meaning that the drift part is precisely the same as this equation we obtained through making the assumption that the joint, I mean, the joint density can be factorized, right? So, but, okay, the difference is, 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 is this, so cast integral term, right? Because okay, rows of SP, you have the noise. If we remove the noise part, we still get this equation. So one thing I like to say is that uh, this equation gives the right answer when when d equal to one. But what there, there, there are two different ways of interpreting this equation, right? One, one, one way is what I just showed show you, which is okay, qn is approximately q1 multiplied q1 multiplied q1. So this is clearly is not the right way to interpret. I mean, uh, uh, okay, this is clearly wrong. But but there's another way of interpreting this equation, which is in my SPD, I ignore the noise. Then I just precisely get this equation. So I don't. I. I it's not still. I, it's it's still. Um, okay. I don't think. Okay. How should I put this? Uh, I, I still believe that there's a chance for this equation to be uh, to be describing really what's going on. So does this answer your question? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so maybe let me ask one more question, and then uh, or anyone else. Uh, yeah. Uh, why? Why we are waiting? So I mean. Uh, the whole hierarchy of PD is really interesting to me. It, it's actually fascinating. Um, if okay, I don't want to look at the SPD with the DV over there. If I only look at the whole hierarchy of PDEs with the QM, uh -huh. um, is there a way to do some sort of backward iterations or whatever the thing is that I I mean you would need to have some condition for Q2 and Q3 so that you can prove the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, precise asymptotic, right? Uh -huh. If you do some kind of like uh, whatever, uh, sort of like backward iteration or anything like that, how do you find a way to read up information for Q1 and uh, Q2 and Q3? I mean, like, um, 
it 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 it's it just not clear to me how how do you start it right i mean because you have you have the whole sort of hierarchy and how how to find good information for q2 and q3 right yeah, yeah exactly so so i think that's a bit okay so uh i think i think okay in my point of view i think to study a hierarchy is a bit hopeless because um okay there's no okay i don't know how to start right so so I think, uh, okay, I don't know whether this answers your question, but I think the best that one can try is to try to try to combine with uh, like more 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 publicity argument to 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 get information about this Q two and Q three. Then okay, maybe start from this equation to to try to see what's the behavior of of Q one. I don't think one can just directly look at the PD hierarchy to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you're not. I cannot hear it. Yeah, I'll repeat. I'll repeat. Yeah. So, uh, so Nicolas' question uh, uh, is that. Would you have some sort of limiting behavior of Q infinity in mind? I mean, not not in time, but you have Q one, Q two, Q three, and would there be some sort of limiting behavior of Q infinity as the index uh, and goes to infinity, and then you can go use that sort of as some prediction to go back to read up information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very very good question. So so basically, um. It's like when I was trying to explain this perspective of um, viewing it as independent workers in the in the same environment, right? So a very natural thing for you to do is to uh, to let the number of particles go to infinity. So maybe there's some limiting behavior. Then, okay, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> the quick answer is that I don't know, but it's uh, it's a terrific question. I think uh, maybe something that is re related to this is uh, let's see whether I can find this. Um, for this thing here, um, uh, for this thing here, that's 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 the wrong thing, right? Because um, because that's not rho, that's this z here. For this thing here, people have studied the say the behavior of this operator or the behavior of solution to this PDE when the number of particles go, go to infinity. And there you you may have something, for instance, like mean field approximation or things of that sort. I don't know whether that's what you are referring to, but uh, yeah, I, I, I thought about the, the, the PD hierarchy from this perspective, but I, I didn't know how to do that. But that's a terrific question, yeah. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe, okay. So maybe one last question is that you have the Burgers equation for you, right? Y yes. Uh, the stochastic Burger equation. Clearly, in one, it's just kind of a uh, uh, you know a, a dilemma, right? Because in one D, the stochastic Burger equation is easier to be understood. In two, three D or Hager is looks to me. What 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 do you mean by easily understood? <laughs> I mean, right? Because <laughs> it, in Hager dimensions, it's a system, and it's, it's a uh, system. I think okay, yeah, okay. From this perspective, yes, I think even in one D, I think this equation with the random forcing is hard enough. Yeah. So so yeah, so I think um, if you want to approach this problem from this perspective, the first thing you should do is to look at this field, um, then tell me that uh, okay, what uh, what are the the correlation property of this field? So how fast does the current function decay, and how strong the correlation is? I think this is already super hard in this context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I just meant that in three D or Hager, you have the sort of like the the approximation is more reasonable, but the burgers, uh, the stochastic burger equation is harder, right? But in one day, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh. So there is no further qu further question, and um, because it's a Zoom talk, and then I think uh, we can let you have this uh, late lunch now. So <laughs> thanks thank a lot. Much. So uh, again, again, uh, thank you very much for for being very flexible with me, and I wish I could be there, and I wish the conference a success, and I joined the the discussion a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, see you soon. See you, yeah. Bye. Bye.